So Andrew and Jill, this is very exciting for us. I know that everybody in this room would like to thank you both for all your hard work and everything you have done to make this convention such a success. Merci beaucoup pour tout votre travail et tout ce que vous avez fait pour que ce congrès soit un tel succès. And to wrap up what has been an exciting and dynamic convention, we really appreciate you agreeing to sit down for this close-up and personal conversation. Those of us in this room who follow politics intensely, so that's everybody, understands that when a man or a woman takes on the role of party leader, the job isn't just about them, but it involves the commitment of the entire family. So Jill, to you, on behalf of the wider conservative family, uh, thank you so much. Everybody understands the role of a political spouse is a very demanding one, and it's a role that really deserves our respect and our appreciation. So, so, Andrew, I will ask you this question. Uh, what does it mean to you to have Jill not only as your life partner, but as your political partner? Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it's the only way that this could be possible. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't an easy decision uh, to run. Uh, as, as you can see, we've got a, a very young family, and the implications of this job are huge. And I want to thank everyone for all their support, and thanks for all your, your, your best wishes uh, to us, because it, it, is, it is tough. And I have so much respect for anybody uh, who puts them, makes these types of sacrifices, no matter what party they're in, because uh, it is very difficult. And so we did come to the decision together. I, uh, we had a, a few chats, and uh, might have been after a couple of glasses of wine one, uh, one evening that uh, Jill finally said I think that's the yes. one I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I wouldn't want to do it any other way. I, I don't think that uh, you can have a, a good husband, a good father, and a good public official uh, if you don't have that support. And I'd either be, uh, you know, a, a bad leader if I didn't have the support of the family and, and, and that wasn't working, and I'd be a bad husband or, or a bad father if I didn't as well. So uh, it's essential to have that support at home. I think it's true for any profession, really, that, that requires a lot of that uh, sacrifice, but I'm just so honored and blessed and just want to thank you. <laughs> Uh, Jill, earlier this summer when the Me Too conversation was at its uh, highest peak, I tweeted out how proud I was as a female member of Andrew's uh, caucus to know that I work with a man who had the utmost respect for his female colleagues. And actually what I wrote in my tweet was that while it's true Andrew Scheer will never stage a topless photo shoot, at least I don't think you ever will, I, I don't know. That would clear the room so fast. <laughs> Okay, so I had that right. But I said, his abundant and obvious respect for his female colleagues and above all for his wife and his family makes me proud to serve in his caucus. So, Joe, when I think about how proud I am, I, I, I want to ask you um, about Andrew's high character and how, how that makes you feel about him. Absolutely, I'm proud of Andrew every day. Um, I think a big thing for me is I'm just proud to be part of a party that, um, allows, not allows women, has women in important, powerful roles, and they earned it just the way anybody else would earn that position. No one's... <laughs> There's not a single woman in caucus or in shadow cabinet because it's 2018. Every woman there is there because she deserves to be there. And in terms of my pride for Andrew, he honestly treats me like with the utmost respect, every decision that we make, we make together. And um, I have veto over <laughs> anything if I need to use it. <laughs> we also hear she, he she, says, with, she withholds royal assent uh, from time <laughs> <Sorry>. to time. <laughs> and you say sorry a lot. We hear that as well. But <laughs> he starts out with sorry. <laughs> um, it's very obvious uh, to anyone who looks at the two of you that you have a very deep, and loving relationship, that your, your bond is, is, is very apparent to us all. Can you share with us what you think are the secrets for a strong marriage? 
Yeah, um, you know, some of the, some of the old uh, ones that everyone's heard, you know, never go to bed angry, um, you know, uh, that, that's key, you know, to try to solve things before they, they fester or just kind of uh, build up. Uh, we, we learned early on that it, it's all about communication and, uh, you know, there's no sense in, in, in letting resentment built if, if someone said something or did something that's, uh, you know, hurt someone's, uh, either of our feelings, just kind of get it out of the way right away. One of the biggest, best pieces of advice we ever got uh, when we were uh, engaged from another couple was two things. It was kind of two sides of the same coin. It was uh, make it easy, uh, be quick to say sorry if, if you need to, and then the flip side of that is make it easy for the other person to say sorry. And a lot of times, you know, when, when you ha we have a fight, uh, it's tempting to want to hold on to that, that anger, or, and if someone, if, if your spouse says, listen, I'm sorry, then okay, they've said sorry, they've addressed it, and, and try to be, be quick to forgive, and, and that's a big part of it, I think. Yeah, and the other one we always do is we never, ever bring up an old fight. So once it's settled, it's settled, and we just promised each other we'll never bring that thing up again. So, yeah, yeah there's... We don't have to deal with that, you know, back in 2008 when you said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, once it's over, it's over. I heard someone say recently that one secret is, is to never criticize your spouse. But do you ever ask for constructive criticism from Jill? <laughs> All the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it started out uh, early when, you know, Jill would say things like, uh, you know, Andrew, you really should uh, not just iron the fronts of your shirt, like you should <laughs> iron. Until like a year ago, yeah. he only ironed this. Well, it was, That's not a thing. It's, it's, it's efficiency. It saves, it saves time. <laughs> I said, but what if you get hot? What if you get hot? Like, I just keep my jacket on all day anyway. No, he said his body warmth irons it. <laughs> hey, Jill, these oh, are sorry. our friends, sorry. but we don't have to open up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he never makes the bed. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, if we didn't say earlier how glad we are that Jill's around, we're, we're going <laughs> to definitely uh, focus on that now. Um, how about it as parents? Obviously, the demands on your time are endless. You could be out 24-7. So how do you create some uh, normalcy in your home with, with each other, but with your children, too? Well, we've turned our kids into night owls. So, like, even if Andrew gets home from an event at 930, he starts popping the popcorn and they all line up, all five kids and Andrew along the couch and they watch a show together or they, whatever, they have got a game going or, but they always spend time together and often sometimes it is late so we've taught them to stay up late with Andrew and sleep in. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I think the, the key is when I'm home, I'm home. And uh, I've heard from other people who hold held, held these types of roles and they said, you know, the, the worst thing that happens is uh, your work creeps into your family side and, and you really do have to draw you know, big red circles around your home time. And uh, so my staff know that if, if we booked a personal day, barring an emergency that needs to be dealt with right away, you know, things have to wait. Because uh, it's not fair to the kids to say, okay, we're going to go to the park now, or we're going to go see this, and then I'm on my phone uh, all afternoon. So th that's a big part of it too. Obviously FaceTime, we do a lot of that. And where we can, and as you can see in some of the pictures, when we can uh, bring the kids along too and, and show them uh, the, one of the great things that's, that comes with this job is getting to discover so much of Canada, so many parts of Canada. Uh, so that's a, uh, that's a big part of uh, staying together as well. It is often said that political discourse is more toxic and corrosive than it's ever been. I'm wondering if you think that's tr a true thing historically. And if that is true, how do you to shield your, your family from the harsher elements of politics? And, and Andrew, how do you potentially shield Jill or invite Jill, how do you shield Andrew? Yeah. Well, we've, um, I think with social media, it's brought in a whole new aspect that people sort of feel brave to criticize and we want to protect our kids and each other from that. Although you don't mind scrolling through it, it's me who's <laughs> got a thin skin, but our kids haven't asked for any of that social media type stuff yet. Um, but we are probably getting there. They're approaching their teen years and we're gonna have to come up with a strategy for that. But until then, we'll keep them keep them as sheltered as possible. 
Yeah, I, I think it has become very negative, and I think that some some forms of social media uh, make it easier to kind of be anonymous and just say things you would never say uh, to each other in person. You know, uh, I've got lots of family members who I disagree with. I've got friends I've went, gone to high school with, and we disagree on a lot of things. And I wouldn't, you know, if we ever had a discussion, I wouldn't, you know, question uh, the, legitim the legitimacy of their birth and, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what the, their, their mental competence and things like that. But on, on on Twitter, you get that all the time. You know, just just for saying something that is a well thought out position that your party has, you you get all that back. So I try to ignore all of that. It is difficult. I do find myself kind of uh, scrolling through, and uh, my staff want me to just you know not do that anymore. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, I, I I worry about the ability for uh, issues to be talked about in a way where people can have a difference of opinion or, or ask legi legitimate questions. And, you know, we see it, the, we see the debate becoming polarized on things that, you know, you wouldn't have thought 10 or 15 years ago that it would evoke this type of reaction. And, uh, you know, not, not to get all political again, but, you know, calling uh, Ontario cabinet ministers un-Canadian and uh, calling Lisa Raid a Neanderthal <laughs> when, when the left really comes out with this vitriolic language because we dare to have a different perspective on things. It is worrisome for how that debate's going to be carried out. Right, because I was, I was going to ask you if that social media atmosphere leaches into the political arena, you know, into the House of Commons, into your ability to have good relationships with people across the aisle. Uh, it, it can, for sure. And, w and when I was speaker, I really did, you know, to try to encourage people to you know, debate the issue. Uh, the, 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 we have lots of things of substance to say, and when people come from different political parties and different parts of the country, uh, different experiences, um, they believe that their idea, their proposal will be better for Canada. Uh, they, they're wrong, um, ours are, uh, but, uh, um, but treat them with that respect and, and convince them that they're wrong or convince Canadians that they're wrong, and you're right, but let's leave the personal stuff alone. And that's why when you do have, you know, Bill Morneau calling Lisa Raid a Neanderthal, it's just, you know, that's, it's unbecoming of a, of a government minister, but it is reflective of a mindset that uh, left-wing parties and left-wing politicians uh, are, are adopting more and more. Uh, Jill, one of the great pleasures of political life is the opportunity it gives us to help others. Uh, this morning, we saw a video about your nephew, Lincoln, but because everyone didn't see it, I think we're actually going to be able to show it again. Okay. And we'll look at it, and then we can talk about it okay. right after, if that's all teed up. Good job. I'll never forget the day Lincoln got sick. He was my sister's youngest, at the time a beautiful, healthy three-year-old. My sister Erica and I are extremely close. Between us, we have nine kids. We live a block apart from each other and we're constantly at each other's houses. The day Lincoln got sick, our world turned upside down. What started as a routine doctor's appointment for paleness and bruising turned into every parent's worst nightmare. Lincoln had a severe case of aplastic anemia. A virus had shut down his bone marrow. He wasn't producing red cells, white cells, or platelets. A simple cold or cut could kill him. If you're a parent, you know what it is to feel powerless sometimes when it comes to your kids. Waiting for a donor is a special kind of helplessness. Watching my amazing sister and her husband go through that was so difficult. Any of us would have given anything we had to save Lincoln, but none of us could. So we did what any family would do if they're waiting for a miracle. We had hospital room dance parties. Uncle Andrew found a way to get Lincoln to take his terrible tasting medication, and Henry shaved his head in solidarity. And we prayed that out there, somewhere, there was a match for Lincoln. After weeks of blood transfusions, waiting and praying, we got the call we'd been waiting for. Lincoln had a match. One, one match in the world. Not only a compatible donor, but a perfect 10 out of 10 match. On September 21st, 2016, Lincoln received his life-saving transplant. Because of this generous stranger, we have our boy back, our beautiful, healthy five-year-old. I often wonder what would have happened if this anonymous donor hadn't taken the time to register. We think about this angel every day. So how do you thank a stranger for saving your loved one's life? This is how I do it, by telling Lincoln's story. So maybe you'll consider being a donor. If you're between the ages of 17 and 35, you can register. Go to onematch.ca to find out how you can be a miracle to another family, just like ours.
Well, that, that is truly a beautiful and remarkable story. So do you want to tell us more about One Match and the work that you do with them? Yeah, One Match is the Canadian Bone Marrow Registry. And if you're between the ages of 17 and 35, you can go to onematch.ca and order a kit. And it's just two Q-tips and you rub the inside of your cheek and you mail it back and you can be on the, on the list to become a donor. Your chances of being called are about one in 500 and you could save someone's life like my boy Lincoln. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to ask Andrew this question in English, and he's going to answer it in, in maybe both languages for us. <laughs> um, you've both, well, Andrew, you've been involved um, in politics really all your adult life. Uh, you became an MP in 2004 at the age of 25. Can you tell us who was the person or the people in your life who most motivated or inspired you to become involved with public service? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, I was interested in politics at a very young age. I, I guess it was just because, uh, you know, my dad worked at a newspaper uh, in Ottawa, and so the current affairs were always the topic of supper table conversation. And I always had a bit of a, a problem with authority. And uh, I think I think my my dad instilled in me uh, at a young age that uh, in Canada you you get to have a say. You know, and he would often say, you know, decisions are made by those who show up. And whether it's at a, a PTA meeting or a school board meeting or a union meeting or a political convention, if you show up at a, at a meeting, you get to decide things. And that's what got me involved. Uh, et après ça, j'étais uh, très très jeune, mais uh, j'ai vu uh, le, uh, le, les, les pays de l'Europe en Est uh, uh, quitter le système de communisme et adopter la démocratie. Et ça, c'est tellement inspirant de voir les, les gens qui travaillent très très fort pour les générations d'avoir les mêmes choses qu'on a ici à Canada. Uh, I watched the fall of communism across Eastern Europe when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, and that was very inspirational to watch people who had fought so hard for the things that we had here. And I guess that always just, you know, inspired me to, to stay involved so we can protect what so many people around the world yearn for uh, here in Canada. Some nine-year-olds watch the Smurfs, but... <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's always been interested in politics all his life, so it was Wait, a perfect but, job. But how about you, Jill? Because you also have a life of public service, as we're saying, you know, yeah. you, you are Andrew's partner. You do everything together. So how, who inspired you? I actually think back sometimes to our childhoods and Andrew would have been across the country talking politics around the kitchen table and my family would have been around the kitchen table talking about football. <laughs> but um, I'd say that my parents prepared me for this life. They both have service hearts. My dad worked with at-risk youth from the time he was 18 till he passed away at 54. And um, my mom, her whole, she's devoted her whole life to volunteer work. My mom volunteers probably 60 hours a week. And uh, that's all, all, day and night, that's what she does. So um, she, she raised us with that heart for public service. Okay, well, speaking of your family, Jill, you not only have a very accomplished husband, but you also have a very well-known brother, uh, former Seahawk and now Buffalo Bill kicker, John Ryan. <laughs> Go Bills. <laughs> so I presume you grew up in a sporty family, and I was wondering if that's what attracted you to Andrew. Uh, no, and, uh, no. <laughs> No, what I really wanted to ask you I, was... I did play quite a few sports. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, what about the kids? Uh, do, what do they follow? They follow uh, politics or football? What, what intrigues them more? Um, whichever's on TV, they kind of, they <laughs> like to be with us, so they just watch whatever's on. But I think they've developed an interest in both. Um, they've learned er at early ages things that are injustices, and so that has got them into politics, and um, they enjoy the Sunday afternoons hanging out with us watching football, so I'd say they're, they're into both. We play a lot of sports, as uh, we've got so many kids that we can uh, you know, play a lot of backyard baseball and, and football with the cousins, um, and, but it, 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 it really is different. My, my oldest son is very, very uh, intellectual, and he's very, very keen on learning things. He, he just decided the other day that he was, we were talking about which languages were hardest to learn, 
And I, I said, uh, I always thought that languages that you had to learn a new alphabet would be an extra level of difficulty uh, up. So we started talking about different alphabet. Anyway, but by the end, by supper time, he had taught himself the Greek alphabet, and he's 13 years old. So I thought, well, that's, that's a good sign. But then we'll sit down and watch uh, a playoff game or a hockey game, go out and play, play catch in the backyard as well. Alors, je pense que pour tous mes enfants, je pense qu'il y a un bon mélange. Mais mes filles sont très athlétiques. Uh, uh, our daughter Grace is into rock climbing. She's super fast. She's uh, she likes playing baseball as well. There's parkour all over the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. And and Henry's just uh, a big tank. He's 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 going to do very well in sports. He's got a. We actually team. we have a game that we play in our backyard, and it's called Henry Ball. It started out as normal baseball, but Andrew had to change the rules so many times to accommodate Henry that he's, we just. He's the youngest boy. Yeah, he's, so we just called it Henry Ball. He gets six strikes. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's always. He safe. can't get out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I. I imagine um, after this long, busy weekend, including your, it's been your anniversary weekend as well. So once again, happy anniversary. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure your kids are much on your mind and you miss them very much, but just to help us understand and get to know your, your family better, maybe you could give us a little bit of a description about each of, each of the kids. Okay. Thomas is our oldest, he's 13, and he is a very intellectual. He's actually right now, we, we wish he was teaching himself French, but he's teaching himself Norwegian. <laughs> For whatever reason, I don't know, he found an app to learn languages and he can... Mais, mais on, va, on va assurer qu'il apprend le français parce que c'est essentiel. <laughs> We're pushing the French. <laughs> uh, une chose, un avantage de déménager à Ottawa, c'est que nos enfants maintenant ont l'opportunité d'apprendre de, de français. Uh, et c'est merveilleux pour chacun de il, il a commencé uh, et uh, on va assurer qu'il continue. Um, he's, he's also got a very quick wit. He's, uh, he's hilarious. Uh, we were watching, we started watching classic movies together and uh, we were watching Fiddler on the Roof, which uh, is a great family show. Yeah, fantastic movie. <laughs> and there's this scene where the main character was out celebrating with uh, making an arrangement for one of his daughters to be married and they, had, they were celebrating with some vodka and, and the next scene is him waking up in the morning. He's got a massive headache and he's kind of, oh, and his wife's yelling at him and he's moving around. And um, uh, my my kids, one of my daughters said, "What's wrong with Teviev? Is is he sick? Is he is he is he sick?" And I said, "Well, you know, sometimes if you drink a little bit too much one night, then the next morning, uh, you know, you have a headache, you'll feel kind of sick." And anyway, I started explaining all this, and my son was just looking at me. He was maybe 11 at the time, with a twinkle in his eyes, and he said, "Dad, how would you know?" I'm <laughs> 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 gonna watch that. So that's Thomas. <laughs> Grace. Yeah. Grace is an animal lover to the yes. core. She uh, she even likes like worms and beetles. Yeah, bugs and uh, She once had dog. a pet salamander for like she's, a day and a half. But she's an entrepreneur. Elle a commencé une petite entreprise. She started her own small business. Grace's dog walking service. Uh, and she even has lawn signs. <laughs> she actually does. Yeah. And door knockers. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, Madeline is just always joyful she's she uh she's into all the typical things that a nine-year-old would be into she loves stuffed animals and, and glittery t-shirts glittery t-shirts and, and that but she's just always really joyful she's always in a good mood always very silly and um and and yeah so that's maddie henry mm, henry <laughs> <laughs> Henry is uh, a lot of work. Uh, he's, <laughs> but, but he's, he's, you know what? Henry's empathetic and always yeah. has been. He can see from a mile away if you're not having a good day and he knows exactly what to do. He's uh, yeah, I didn't mean a lot of work in a negative way. He's just got so much energy. He's, he's you know, he, he's like a bouncy ball. He's just always bopping along and, and wanting to be really active. And he's the type of kid that if we're sitting down on the couch watching TV, he would never just sit beside us. He would, like, jump on us. And Some of the guys here have probably been wrestled to the ground of Stornoway by Henry. Yes, I think some of my colleagues... <laughs> Raise your might. hand if you've been wrestled to the ground by Henry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and Mary's two and a half, so uh, she already has some indications. Elle a déjà des caractéristiques de son propre personnalité. She's the boss. Uh, she is the uh, she's the center of gravity that everything moves around right now. She's very, very, very strong-willed, and that's very true. Spunky as all get yes. out. Yeah. 
And she like was cute. named for your mother. Hmm? She was, yeah. Yeah, she was named after my mom, uh, Mary, and, and thankfully they got to know each other a little bit. Uh, I, how old would she have been? Just one and a half. One and a half. And uh, someone did tease me a little bit. They said, you know, you waited till your fifth child before you honored your mom. But uh, <laughs> I thought, well, never too late. So. <laughs> All right, you two. Well, listen, we are so appreciative and grateful to you for talking to us in such a personal way this wow. afternoon. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything that the two of you are doing, and Jill, in particular, you and the children, the sacrifices that you are making uh, to make our Conservative Party strong, to make Andrew the next Prime Minister of Canada in 2019. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Merci. Make sure they go up there. <laughs>